welcome to the series two of the webinar introduction to co-working spaces i hope you enjoyed the last seminar in case you attended once so uh, as sonia suggested i'd be spending about uh, first 10 to 15 minutes on explaining what co-working is going through the qualitative and theoretical aspects covering the business model and the second half will be more uh, focus on financial model for which i will switch to an excel spreadsheet we have the outputs from Excel pages in this presentation, which will be uploaded for your benefit by Sonia towards the end. Okay, so what is co-working? So co-working is a place where a group of people uh, come together and work on different projects. Now, those group of people might not be from the same company. And that's the key difference between a co-working space and a traditional office space. So let's think of a traditional office space. You know, you might have a building in, in central London, which has 10 stories and each story is taken by a different occupier. You have your own breakout area, you have your own meeting rooms and people within the same organization are just interacting with each other. Co-working space is, you know, same building, you have 10 stories, but you have a common breakout area, common lunch area, common games area. So you get an opportunity not to just interact with people from your own company, but also people from other companies. Uh, I'd like to highlight quite a few differences between the business model and the characteristics of traditional real traditional office space, which I refer to as traditional real estate and co-working space, which is more of a for service. So in you know traditional office space, uh, space is a product. It's a commoditized product. Uh, people lead out space so that they can come and work. That's the expectation. Whereas uh, in co-working is seen more as a service. So by service, uh, I mean, it's not, in, in today's world, especially after pandemic, uh, well-being has become very important. Social aspects of work, workplace has become very important. So what happens in the co-working space is essentially uh, you'll have a number of social events. There could be yoga classes. There could be a gym. Uh, there could be a games room. So it focuses a lot on employees' uh, well-being as well. Uh, the second key difference is uh, in traditional real estate, one usually pays a rent and these contracts are typically longer term in nature. So a rent contract would be anywhere between three to, five, two, three to five years or ranging going as long as 10 years. Whereas in co-working space, you end up paying a monthly membership fee. And, and some, some co-working operators offer daily or weekly memberships as well. What that does is one doesn't does not need to commit to uh, a long term fee uh, for renting out spaces. So and this works particularly well for startups, right? Because uh, when you are in the uh, when you're working for a startup and it's in a, in a growth phase, you don't know how quickly you'd want to scale up and how quickly you'd want to want uh, how quickly you'll increase the team size. So even if say if a startup goes to a co working space, they can start with as small as taking membership for just five seats and if in months time they need uh, to expand their workforce by 10 more people they can add 10 more seats pretty easily whereas in a traditional uh, real estate space that would be very uh, difficult and other other uh, key uh, difference i would say is uh, so in a traditional real estate setup landlord owns a building whereas in in a co-working space landlord owns multiple brands and the focus is on uh, uh, guest experience. Uh, and last, I would say, is uh, in traditional real estate, you generate return on investment by offering an area that is fit for use, whereas in uh, co-working spaces, the return is often a function of space that you offer to the uh, your tenants or clients, but also a bunch of integrated services to create the right ecosystem for different uh, businesses that lead out the co-working space. Uh, moving on, uh, what are the benefits of uh, co-working? So some of them, I uh, some of the benefits we briefly touched upon while explaining the difference, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of uh, highlight four key differences very quickly over here. So first one is flexible contracts and uh, the average deal length for co-working space in uh, in the UK is about 19 months, whereas, you know, in traditional office space, it's in years. Uh, and when I say it's in years, it could be five to 10 years, five to 10 years. So that's a long, long commitment. And this is particularly important for startups because you know, 
a lot of time there's cash flow uncertainty for startups uh, if people are burning money and they want to scale down real estate if you commit it for a 10 year contract you can't do that but you know in a co-working space because you are rolling over your membership monthly it is uh, very easy and as the chart on the right shows term flexibility is one of the main reason that influences the demand for flex office space uh, in europe a second uh, you know think of co-working space as a pay as you go model or pay only for the required space so when you make a when you invest in a traditional office or lead out a traditional office you need to provide for meeting rooms pantry uh, and you are committing to paying rent for this space because you usually pay rent in terms of pound per square feet or pound per square meter over here if you are using a co-working space uh, if you are using a meeting room say for 3 hours a day or 10 hours a week you just pay for that duration if you're not using the meeting rooms you don't have to pay for that so it gives you a better value for back for a uh, lot of businesses third better networking opportunities in a traditional office setup you meet your colleagues uh, who work in the same business over here uh, in a co-working space uh, you meet people from different businesses different industries and it gives you a lot of uh, chance to network and a lot of these co-working service of providers hold networking sessions on a regular basis and lastly employee well-being usually what if now nowadays in traditional office space sector also uh, employers have started investing uh, in workplace well-being by offering you know an on-site gym or maybe a swimming pool but very few employees do that but you know it's a pretty standard norm within a co-working space and one thing what uh, i figured out from speaking to various people in the industry because there's such a strong focus on employee well-being it's much easier to motivate employees to come back to work because they have some added incentive to travel to work rather than you know working just from home uh market trends so uh you know co-working space tends uh, is doing well many large uh, operators have reported the uh, 80s uh, occupancy in the european markets which is quite encouraging uh, obviously co-working is more of a popular concept in urban areas uh, so for example london prague amsterdam capitals it's unlikely to, it's unlikely to work as well uh, in the in the regions because you know uh, the startup ecosystem uh, or the freelancing culture is more based out of the main cities rather than a peripheral uh, locations flex office demand in london so i i thought this is quite an interesting chart in terms of just to give you a very quick overview of what's ha happening in london so flex office rates in london have gone up by 10% uh, in the last uh, year and what we've seen is uh, businesses are willing to pay a premium that is more money for taking uh, co-working spaces which offer a very good spectrum of amenity spaces and have high spec uh, a high spec uh, built out and as you can see from the chart on the right the number of desks transacted is increasing quarter on quarter every year just to give people a sense of what kind of rates uh, you typically pay on uh, co-working again focusing on uh, london over here so you know again rents in central london have gone up by 10% and uh, average rates in central london could vary anywhere between high 200s to uh, you know mid 300s depending on the location proximity to the tube station the overall quality of the building you're renting and the spectrum of amenities offered so uh, sticking to the timeline uh, i think the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes of the session i will uh, focus on the financial model and for that what i'm going to do is i'm going to switch my screen to a spreadsheet. Uh, Sonia, can you confirm if you can see the spreadsheet? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So this is a fully flexible and dynamic model for uh, flex working space. And it is very different compared to a traditional office space model because in a traditional office space model, you have, uh, you have rent rules and uh, from the rent rules, the focus is just on calculating, you know, per uh, square feet rent and there aren't any there aren't usually any additional services for which landlords earn money now let's go through this example so this is a flex working space model uh, we have assumed that uh, 
we are underwriting a co-working space, which is in London, and it has 200 desks, 12 meeting rooms, and it offers virtual service package. For those of you who don't know what a virtual service package is, so for example, mm. if I work as a freelancer and I want to get a, a concierge or a reception for me, I don't have to hire someone. I can ask one of these co-working spaces and they have these full bouquet of services that they offer. So if anyone calls on that dedicated landline number, they'll say, we're calling from, xyz office and that office is owned by me so someone calling wouldn't know that they're calling a flex working space they'll it will give an impression that i have a dedicated reception or a concierge area so uh, there are a lot of value value uh, uh, add or add-on services that you sell as a part of a co-working space one best practice and tip i would like to give here from a modeling perspective is build unit economics for each line of product or service when modeling out co-working cash flows. So for example, over here, we have identified two services that probably a co-working space is providing. One is meeting rooms and second is virtual office package. So what I've done is I specifically make assumptions for how long the meeting room is available for in a day and what's the pound per hour. And based on that, I should be able to calculate that what my occupancy will be on based on certain occupancy, what kind of income I should be generating. More the lines of services you have, uh, it's better to create different schedules for each line of services rather than clubbing them in one schedule or trying to make a generic uh, assumption because it is really important to build a, financial model, model taking a bottoms up approach and bottoms up approach basically means uh, you know building at the unit level rather than taking a top down approach which is a much more simplified approach but you know the accuracy is questionable where you say your if your desk revenue is say 100000 you'll assume your 10% additional 10% revenue is from meeting rooms now whether that's 10% or 20% depends on the utilization rate so uh, I would highly suggest that uh, stick to unit economics when building a financial model. Let's look at a rent rule. So this is a pretty simplified rent rule that I've created for you guys. Uh, we have assumed as from the assumption page, there are 200 desks. Uh, we are saying for each desk, the membership fee is about 450 pounds a month and we we'll assume 100% occupancy. Uh, later on, I'll show that I've provided for 2% vacancy allowance. Then I've said there are 12 meeting rooms. Uh, the number over here, 3240, is calculated based on the schedule that I've created. So as you can see, I've said got uh, 12 meeting rooms. They're available for uh, uh, nine uh, nine hours a day, and rent is, uh, rent is 12 pounds an hour. And if I operate 30 days a week, this is the rent I will get, assuming the fully occupied. But I expect that in every day my meeting rooms will only be occupied for 75 percent of the time so if i have nine hours i'm saying my meeting rooms will roughly be uh, occupied for about seven odd hours and it, there will be a vacancy in the meeting or it will be unutilized for two hours and hence i've used a 75 percent occupancy for meeting rooms next is the virtual office packages so i've said that out of the 200 desks that my uh, co-working spaces offering, uh, 25 businesses will opt for a virtual office package. And for a virtual office package, we're charging about 1500 pounds a month. So that leads to additional revenue. And the total revenue we are making is uh, 1879, which you guys will see will ultimately flow over here. We'll come to that uh, very quickly. Next, let's look at very quickly the acquisition uh, and the exit assumption. So we've said the acquisition date is 21. I'm saying the acquisition price is 20 million. And the implied entry cap rate is 6.5%. So this is a very important metric because uh, if you are preparing for a real estate job or if you are trying to understand real estate model, this is how typically real estate professionals uh, uh, talk pricing about, so they say my entry is 6.5% or my entry is 7%. What does entry mean? So this 6.5% basically means NOI as a percentage of my entry price. So over here, G95 is the NOI. So it's the adjusted income 12 months forward divided by what I'm paying. So it basically means for every pound I'm investing in buying this co-working space, 
I'll be generating 6.5% return on an annualized basis. And this is a standard way of pricing a real estate asset globally. Uh, then we've got some acquisition costs and loan issuance fee costs. I wouldn't go too much into it because this is more into corporate finance territory, whereas the focus over here right now is more on understanding co-working spaces. And similarly, I've made some assumption on exit price. I'll ignore the debt part for now uh, because, you know, as I said, it's not a corporate finance seminar. This is more of a co-working space. Uh, if people have any questions on the debt module or any of the corporate finance related stuff, feel free to write to uh, Sonia and we are happy to address it for you. Now, I've laid out operating assumptions uh, very clearly. One rule of thumb I would highly recommend everyone following and we'll cover in the best practices slide is to lay down assumptions in blue so that anyone who's using your model knows that these are the inputs they need to change and anything in black is an output. So if anything in black is an output, that basically means they don't have to change that. And it's, it's, it's basically a byproduct of some of the inputs that you provided. So I have made assumptions around how much I expect my rental to go by, what will be the bad debt, the general vacancy loss, which I was talking about, what will the OPEX per bed, how much the OPEX will grow by, and how much will I need to invest CapEx just to keep the place up and running. So just to give you an example, you know, I'll have to put some money to repair the lifts or keep it in a new state. There'll be some annual maintenance uh, related with plants and equipment. So that's what the general capex is for. Now let's look at the PNL. So gross potential income. We start with one zero eight zero, and this is just just for the total number of deaths. And as you can see, this is linked very clearly to our rent roll. So everything is linked. Uh, it's in black, so it means it's an output, it's not an input, and it grows thereafter by 4%, as you can, sorry, by 3%, that is my rental income growth rate, as you know. One thing I would like to highlight, which is, which are two, uh, which are two metrics very specific to co-working spaces. One is, sorry, I don't know, why is this Excel misbehaving, but yeah. So one thing I'd like to highlight is two metrics specifically related to co-working spaces. People often use it in the hospitality industry as well is ref par and ref par. What's a ref par? Ref par is revenue per available room. That is your total revenue divided by the total number of rooms that you have. Whereas ref par is your revenue per occupied room, that is the revenue that you are generating per occupied room. What's interesting over here is right now, our ref par and ref par is the same. That's because we are assuming 100% occupancy. Uh, the minute I change occupancy, uh, so the minute I will change occupancy, my ref par and ref par number will change. So this is, this is the occupancy number. If I change to say 50%, Right. So let's go over here. Let's see what this is linked to. So this is linked to, oh, fine. So it's linked to the occupancy over here. Sorry, this was black. I should have changed the blue number. So if I change this number to say 80%, my ref par and ref par numbers are different. And the reason they're different is ref par is 450 because I am selling my rooms at 450 and I'm calculating it on what's occupied. Ref par is lower because I've got some vacant rooms. So I'm dividing the revenue. I've got some vacant desks. So I'm dividing the revenue even by those desks that are not occupied. So my revenue per desk is lower. And these are some technical jargons that you will pick up. And it's, it's very common in the co-working space uh, in the hospitality industry. So having after look at the ref par, ref par, uh, we look at this is the bad debt where our standard assumption was about uh, uh, 3%. It's again all linked. And then this is income from meeting room and virtual office, which you can see 349 and 450, which is flowing directly from here, 349 and 450. All formula link that gets me to my total revenue. Then I've built in some general vacancy allowance. General vacancy allowance are built at about 2%, which again, you can see in the formula is linked, it links into here. What is a general vacancy allowance? General vacancy allowance 
reflects churn in the portfolio. So for example, you'll always have some tenant coming in, some tenant going out. And because someone is coming in, coming and going out, it, it will never be that, you know, a tenant leaves on the 31st and the next tenant comes on first. There's always like a lag between one tenant going out and when other tenant coming in. And that loss of income is reflected to general vacancy allowance. I multiplied the OPEX per desk with the total number of desks. That gives me the OPEX. And there we get the net operating income. From there, I've uh, directed the CapEx uh, per desk that we assumed. So the number that we had over here was 250 per desk to get to uh, adjusted not net operating income. And this is the number that we use to calculate our entry, entry cap rate and the stabilized number we'll use for the exit cap rate. So these are the these are simplified cash flows for a co-working space. I think when you go about modeling it in the real world, the only difference is over here, I've assumed two lines of services, that is virtual virtual space, uh, virtual office uh, assistant service and meeting rooms, whereas in real world, you'll have a number of other uh, services that could be offered by a co-working uh, office uh, operator, but it, it would just vary from asset to asset and co-working office provider to office provider. So having looked at this, I'm moving back to the presentation and these are just the snippets from the Excel model that we just looked at. Uh, the last slide where I'll focus about a minute or two uh, is best practices. So, and a lot of things for those of you guys attended last time for PVSA, you see that the modeling principle and the modeling best practices remain largely the same irrespective of whatever you are modeling uh whether it's real estate or non-real estate so avoid using complicated formulas break down into simple line items so for example you know showing gross revenue and bad debt in simple lines or in the model that we just saw showing desk revenue and the services revenue separately in separate schedule rather than making a complicated formula try and calculate everything in one cell because it just makes it difficult to spot any errors and uh uh, you know, it will just be inefficient and chances of errors will be high. If there are multiple revenue streams, build separate revenue schedule, which we spoke about, uh, adopt a bottoms up approach for each section of the model. So we adopted a bottoms up approach for meeting rooms, another place where we could have adopted a bottoms up approach, or you will probably adopt a bottoms up approach if you're working in the real world is say OPEX. Right now, we assume 2,500 pounds OPEX per bed, uh, OPEX per desk and multiply it with the number of desks to calculate what our total OPEX budget will be. Uh, in reality, that 2,500 per desk will be divided into various line items. It could be the staff cost, it could be the utilities cost, repairs and maintenance. So it's always nice to have it broken down by different line items so that you understand which is the biggest component of your OPEX, what do you need to what do you need to control to achieve some savings and improve your profit margin? Assumptions to be presented clearly. So I can't stress this enough. Always present assumptions in blue so that people understand that these are the only inputs they need to change anything in black. They don't need to do anything. No hard coding in the model. No matter whatever you are trying to build, never do any hard coding. Otherwise, it just defeats the purpose of a model. It becomes static in nature. Everything should be linked to assumptions. And if you're not able to uh, make something work or struggling to uh, make a formula uh, for a module that you're trying to build, Google it, YouTube it, ask for help uh, from people who know it, but never do hard coding in a model because you'll just end up making it static. Uh, build checks to ensure your model is free from error. And lastly, uh, you can always build sensitivity table to analyze the impact of uh, changes in key assumptions on the output, which could be NOI in this case. So I think that's about 